So, um, so Elizabeth and Con and Miami, I think the three of you may not be aware of one of, by the way, am I sharing the whole screen or just my browser? Got you. That's um, well, the problem with that is I was talking bad about Nivendu a second ago, and so he's going to see that. That's going to be um, I should just talk bad about him in front of his face, and then we'll. But uh, anyway, bad jokes. Um, Miami, uh, Khan, and Elizabeth. Just forewarning: there's a standing rule in the community that. Um, you know, that you should uh, record your record your attendance, but you drop your name in. And that um, if you so happen to not put your last name, someone might make one up for you. And uh, no guarantee that you will like or take to it. So um, be warned. All right. <laughs> Generally, people are generous with uh, actually speaking of um, nicknames. So, we're about to get going. I'm sure Nivendi is going to interrupt me and, um, and start the meeting, but I'll say that um, Husseina goes by a couple of different nicknames, actually. She, um, between um, well, Hussein, remind me. So there's it's there's hex dump, but then there's also um, it was it the the Piscean, was that it? Yes, yeah. But I rename myself uh, as Hussein on the channel. People are finding yeah. it hard to reach to me. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. I know. I had to explain that to a couple of folks. Like, oh no, she's here. She's right over here. Nice. So with all those jokes, let's get started, I guess. Uh, this is the machinery development call and today is April 21st and we are six minutes in and we have 10 people on the call. And uh, I guess we will start it with Khan. Uh, would you like to talk about the PR, your recent PR? Yeah, sure. Um... I think the recent PR is just to use the API um, for the import GitHub um, and support it through mesh recuddle. I think I misunderstood it at first and I think I only implement importing, but um, I think it was pointed out that it's also need to be deployed. So I'm currently working on it. Um, but yeah, I think the way I do it is just use like, um, strings package in Golang. Um, I think it's not one of the persons suggests using Viper, um, but I think string does split and things like that. It's a little bit more straightforward. Um, I look into Viper and I wasn't sure exactly like how they do the parsing. So um, yeah, I think another option is to use uh, net URL package in Golang, but even that it still pose some problem because we have to extract um, specific subpath, um, but yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, do others have feedback? Uh, Utkarsh, you might be the closest to this. Is, is it Utkarsh on? Not yet. Um, oh, he, he isn't on yet. Uh, yeah, Lee, like you mentioned about uh, making a design spec for this. Yeah, this, so first of all, Khan, this is fantastic. Man. I was really tickled to see you jumping in and um, making waves. And um, almost no waves are bad waves. <laughs> like, make waves so is good. Um, one item or in this particular area for um, pattern file or pattern functionality, by the way, Khan, we should uh, point out a couple of um, uh, a, a spec on what this is intended to be from a, a bigger vision. 
I think it, it might intrigue. One, two, it will help with, as you think on the problem, it will help with um, part of where we're uh, better understanding where we're trying to go. Generally, this is quite well aligned. There is, I think, um, specific, like leaving aside Viper or strings or net URL or what have you, um, but, co but coming back to it in a moment that uh, there's a couple of nuances around Meshery CTL and it as a user experience. <laughs> and at this point, I think most people on the call are sick of me talking about it as a user experience, but, um, but the, the, the point there is that there's a lot of um, mm, consideration given to how concise the commands can be, how consistent they can be between like the structure by which they're presented, the order in which they're presented in terms of like nouns and verbs and sub you know commands and subcommands and flags and global flags and and just the consistency by which that's done and the across the commands because it's a user experience that um, and high quality user experiences are consistent. Um, as such, I think um, Utkarsh was, had gotten feedback to, I think, to like refactor part of the endpoints, which have some bearing on uh, refactor, like the, the names of the endpoints, which have bearing on what you're doing, but small, you know, easy to, easy to update bearing. Um, more of the, what's more meaningful and more impactful, I think, is the behaviors behind those um, endpoints. <clears throat> and um, we we had gotten into a pretty decent routine of uh, having design specs uh, written up first uh, on an, in a number of areas. And I don't know, th this might be one where we were moving more quickly without a spec, but having multiple folks looking at it, trying to help advance it. Good. It's a good reminder for us to go back into a spec, kind of get some stuff written down, sort of hash out the the nuances of um, meshery CTL commands, and uh, you know hash out all of what we're looking to accomplish, which is it's helpful. Um, Utkarsh, are you on the call yet? Calling to him, um, uh, Drew, can you ping Utkarsh? I know he was just on a call with us, so I'm assuming he's coming back. Maybe we'll circle back to this um, um, topic. The other component to what, what you were just discussing, Con, is um, like uh, strings, net URL, Viper. Um, Abhishek, do you, do you have considerations to share with respect to MeshKit, Viper, uh, the use of portions of mesh kit in mesh CTL? Uh, so the answer would be no, because mesh kit is, uh, uh, mesh CTL is not yet using uh, config packages of mesh kit yet. Uh, in this scenario, in this particular player, I'm not clear about what exactly the use case is, but uh, here I have only one suggestion, which is uh, basically instead of uh, doing a strings parts, you can uh, do uh, use the net URL package to do the uh, parsing of the URLs. That that's one feedback that I can give. I did check net URL, so they have uh, you can get host name, and you can query the entire path. But I believe the task at hand for Khan is to find out the file name, pattern file name, and download load it i guess so and it is at a specific uh, length path length so the net url query path kind of uh, apis they might just return the entire path again on that path he has to use either strings or anything of that sort i think that uh, so the reason is, behind uh... him uh, what is the agenda? Like, basically, you would want to fetch that file. Is that it? I think so. Because he looks for uh, argument number five or six, so that the pattern file name is uh, uh, retrieved. So he could either do it by getting the entire path and doing a 
uh, file absolute path kind of uh, uh, there is no, no. more way to fetch exactly that uh, file name got it uh, so so basically if file fetch is the only uh, is the exact use case then uh, there is a utility function in meshkit which would do that like basically you don't need to write code i sent i posted the link on the chat okay. basically this would uh, fetch the file uh, irrespective of its location basically if it is on the file system or uh, in the remote location it doesn't matter uh, so this utility would get that stuff uh, but uh, they also want to uh, fetch only from layer 5 uh, paths so from github or uh, github raw content so that uh, that's where the host name validation is also done okay that. you need a validation right. yeah i think uh, nayura is a good choice i just wasn't sure because um there is like two different length that we can support um of course if we choose only one over the other like nayura was fine um but we still have to extract like the owner the repository and then the path and then within those there are like the blob mm -hmm. and then like master or like trio master which uh, i think api hasn't support yet so i just wasn't sure like using their url will give the right case because eventually we still have to extract individual like sub path out of it so i was thinking like using strings uh, probably might be more straightforward um, but on. yeah I try to look into uh like the utils go and see whether or not that can help um but yeah yeah if you, if you want to do the validation then i guess uh, strings sound a bit appropriate more appropriate yeah thank you though Yeah, I'm done. I'm done with my paper. Oh, nice. Good. Yeah, yeah. Navendu, do you want to highlight? A <laughs> uh, quick question: Are you checking if the repository is private? Because what if they pass um, a GitHub URL and the repository is private? Uh, currently, I don't think I check it. I wasn't sure. I would assume that um, if it's private, then the API should return an error. Um, but I will I will look more into it. But I think that because the because the machinery API should um, does the importing. So if it couldn't fetch the file, it should report an error. And so because we rely on that API, it sh like in the case of a private repository, it should return an error. So. Uh, okay. Uh, but yeah, I can I can look more into it. Oh, I yeah, might have one. lost connection back here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so are we ready to move on to the next agenda? So, well, almost. Um, Utkarsh, do you want to um help us get organized a little bit? respect to uh, I think you're maybe mid-flight on a small design spec yep uh, so it's not I mean it's not final yet but I can definitely share should share the link actually probably I should share the screen because uh, the link would change I'm moving the spec okay Is it possible? It is. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm not quite sure because I joined uh, this quite late, uh, but uh, uh, basically I joined the discussion quite late. Uh, but uh, I am uh, I'm changing the implementation, the current implementation of uh, remote imports, and that is importing pattern, patterns from um, 
remote uh, places. Uh, it could be an HTTP endpoint, or it could be a GitHub repository, or it could be basically anything. I uh, the current goal is to make it a bit more flexible. So, uh, if you would see the the import, uh, I think Khan must be familiar of uh, how the API looks like. Right now, it has something like uh, this. Uh, that is, we take in the type uh, of uh, of the provider. It could be GitHub or it could be HTTP. Uh, those two are supported right now. But this is uh, going to change in the uh, with a uh, new implementation, and it's moving to a post type request. Uh, that is, uh, the different uh, uh, the different requirements of the request could be in the post body, and those would be first thing would be type. Uh, that is, uh, uh, what type of remote provider it is. Uh, is it GitHub or uh, HTTP or GitLab? Um, it could be anything, as I mentioned in here, that uh, machine server will be taking the responsibility of verifying if a particular provider, uh, file provider is uh, supported or not. It would be on the on the remote provider. Actually, I'm using provider in two contexts here. The remote provider is basically any remote provider. For, uh, for instance, it could be machine remote provider, or it could be some other one. And the second one, uh, the second context here is the files provider. That is, uh, it, it could be a generic HTTP endpoint or GitHub or GitLab or Bitbucket or something like that. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, right now, uh, uh, so the implementation would be heading towards that machine server won't be actually checking if a certain provider is supported or not, certain files provider is supported or not. It will just offload the request if it sees that this particular uh, remote provider actually supports importing files from remote places. Uh, the request would uh, change from get to post, and it will contain a few different parameters, basically fields. The first would be type, as I mentioned. Second would be path. It is also present right now. The third thing that is uh, that uh, that I am adding that was not included in the previous implementation was a metadata field. This metadata field will actually vary. Uh, that is, it will uh, I have not yet mentioned in here. But basically, it will account for the things that could be provide a files provider dependence. So for example, if it's GitHub, it could be that um, you want uh, to take in the, uh, maybe uh, maybe uh, the branch name, as I think Khan uh, recently pointed out in a, uh, in a GitHub issue. Uh, but actually, uh, definitely as uh, Lee mentioned in the issue also, I guess that uh, this uh, that functionality is definitely needed, but it would be implemented in a bit different way. So this is how I was planning to implement it. That is uh, including a metadata field in here. Um, so yeah, that's, and this is a pretty rough spec as of now because I'm still refining it. And then um, as people think on this and as you go to add it, it sounds like you're gonna add it into an existing doc. Do you recall what you'll, You'll after you do that, you'll send out a link, I suspect, in uh, Slack. Yeah, I'll, I I can share this thing because this is where, because this is the original patterns. Uh, this is the original patterns uh, uh, spec. Uh, so this basically because this feature is also an extension of uh, machine patterns. So this will also be added. In here. I was about to add it. Uh, yeah. So let me share this link in the chat. Anybody have any immediate thoughts on this? Also, uh, to answer one more question, I think uh, it was about private repository. So uh, I can quickly address that. Uh, the thing is that uh, if it's a private repository and if you are not authentic authenticated with GitHub, so if, if you are, uh, if you so when you choose Meshri as your provider, Meshri remote provider as a provider. And if you choose uh, to log in with GitHub, then you will be able to access your private repositories. But if you if you choose uh, maybe uh, the non provider that is uh, machine server only and no other remote providers, or maybe some other remote provider in the future, uh, then uh, uh, if if it's none, then uh, private repository importing private repositories won't be possible, and you will get an error from API. 
uh, that uh, this, uh, basically you will get photo code because that's what we'll be getting from GitHub. It won't basically it won't tell that it's unauthorized. It will tell us that that doesn't exist. That's how GitHub actually responses. So, uh, uh, so yeah, you will get a error from API that uh, that particular file does not exist if you haven't authenticated with GitHub. If you did authenticate with GitHub, then uh, you will be able to access your private repositories. Any other questions with someone? Khan, um, where does this leave you? This, this discussion sort of started with your PR, your issue. Does this leave you high and dry for the moment? Or does it leave you with a couple of things to, to look at and move forward with? Yeah, I think definitely helps. Uh, it seems, I, at least like, it seems like the API is still working. So maybe should I like wait until the API is Finish to finish the implementation of measures TL or Utkarsh. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, I so so even though the implementation would change, I will try to make sure that it is uh, so. Uh, if measure CTL is uh, right now using the previous version of the API, I'll try to make sure that that doesn't break. And uh, 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 and this thing uh, like. Basically, these changes these will come in really quickly, so you won't have to wait for a really long time. Uh, so basically, I'm trying to say is that even if uh, it comes, uh, this thing comes within six hours or something, but we, I'll try to make sure that the previous implementation doesn't break. And um, and the second thing that that I was kind of promising was that this will drop in really quickly. Uh, that is, the changes will drop in really quickly, so you, you, like it it shouldn't actually drop you. That, that's what I was coming. Okay. That answers that. Yeah, definitely. That definitely helps. Um, yeah, I can. Um, I think right now I'm only supporting like get, uh, but I think once post out, I can try implement that as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think it shouldn't. Yeah, I think it should be doable. Um, but uh, yeah, I can. I can try it out. Let's see how it goes. Yep. Um, you guys might have spoken to this. I might have missed it. But uh, yeah, at some point, and, and Udkarsh, if this is already, well, yeah, I guess what I'm about to say is probably, or whatever, it, it isn't necessarily directly within Meshery CTL, but would be part of the endpoint, probably for the local provider. And if a remote provider chose to do the same, that, that makes sense. That, uh, that we, we would recurse the URL that someone has given, that we would go through any number of, by default, probably just all the sub-levels of the directories in search of additional, that we would be greedy, so to speak, that we would make it convenient for users to import, do a bulk import. Yeah, so. actually, uh, one thing that I forgot to write in here is that, yeah, so in the previous implementation, it was like you are supposed to give the part of the file uh, so if you give, if you, so right now what I'm heading towards is uh, if you give the path of a file, we, we'll just import file. But if you don't give anything, we'll just uh, reverse the entire repository to find all of the parent files. And um, and if you give a path of a subdirectory, uh, then we'll just go and look into that subdirectory for the for all of the parent files. So as we said, uh, we'll be greedy in searching the Pattern files in the in whatever parts you are given us. If none, it's you. All righty. Back to Navendu, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, next up, we have some mesh map updates from Drew. Hey, hi guys. So let me take over the screen from the windows. Yeah. 
this updates were shown in yesterday's call, but I guess this is a show the community what we have been working on since we don't give updates over here. So for people who don't know, this is Mem Mesh Map. We are sorting, we are sort of working on a visualizer for Mesh where you can see what all things are going in your cluster and you can filter through them. You can select different views to work on it. This is in very early, early stage. Don't criticize the UI. A bit like don't be too harsh right now in your reviews, but they are welcome anyways. So currently I am linked to my cluster. So we have now a ability to read from each of the Kubernetes cluster and filter through them. Like if I can do something like uh, just make sure I have some services, right? Uh, and just, yeah. yeah, so I guess I can fetch them from over there. We have different views from which we can select and stuff like that. So if I go, like few of them are been still being implemented, few of them are implemented. Like this one is not implemented for now. So you won't get any filters for this particular kind of thing. Now multi-cluster is right now being worked on. So you can see it has different kind of filters for different kind of views so which you can see, you can see what all is happening. So let's see what all names this is I have and let's query all of the names this is. So for now, if you don't select anything, it queries all of them. Uh, so yeah, so these are basically the namespaces which we have. And I have a lot of namespaces because I am I was testing out whether it was updating in real time data and not. Names just were the easiest to make, so yeah. So Drew, th this is this inherently demonstrates mesh sync as well. Uh, yeah. And so all the data which we are getting is from meshing itself. Uh, like my meshing is continuously uh, looking at my cluster way, and I am getting logs for each of the changes which I'm making. So like if I add or delete any namespace, it will reflect over here itself. Uh, like the uh, hen. <laughs> I'm gonna run out of animal names, I guess. Uh, so if I do that, we get updated thing over here. So basically what, what is happening over here for the people who don't know, meshing is basically there in my cluster and it is watching for any changes over here. So if you can, if you want to look to the logs, we'll see one log which said I had created a name face in it. So it, uh, it detected a new resource in my cluster it added to the meshing database and we are using that particular database to show you the presentation make sense yeah who, who has questions or comments or who's who's intrigued by this or doesn't think it's useful or is confused by what's being shown, or thinks that this is very lacking, like it's not helpful enough. Who would like yeah, to I get there? I have a question. Yeah, so is this like supposed to show how um, stuff in your cluster are related? It is, yeah, the next step would be to show how each of them are related to each other. And like, this is part of this particular namespace, so it would come inside this. Currently, we don't have any edges to show that which particular resource is related to which one and how and say, but yeah, that is one of the places where we will work on later on in Mishma. If that was a question. Yeah, it is. So like currently if I, let's say have deployments to along with things, it won't show me that this particular deployment is part of this work on that. It is partly because I think for this particular view, we have not defined it in that way, but yeah, we will re refine them one by one to show that hey, meshly operator is part of meshly.
um, I did plans to like make this more interactive. Like if I click on any one of these icons, I could get more information. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's a good input because that's that's also in our plan. And yeah, I feel lackluster now that we don't have it currently to show you guys. But as you can see over here, uh, this panel, I was not hesitant to show it because still there are some bugs over here. But probably what the use case next would be to would be over here. If you click on one particular node, it will show you all the details for that particular node and it will have mesh specific things which you can work around with that particular node. Like if you want to run a performance test on that particular node, if you want to run a SMI test for that particular mesh itself, if you have selected a mesh and stuff like that. That's the uh, vision or the goal of the stuff next to it. And those are good inputs because they are co-aligned with what we are thinking. So thanks for that. <laughs> uh, any other inputs, queries, comments? Yeah, I think this is really nice. Okay, <laughs> thanks for being generous. <laughs> So I want to ask the the shapes. Do they have anything in particular to do with the you know the type of cluster or you know what they are holding in them? So, uh, what the shapes? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, currently we have made a legend. It is we are not sure. It is not in the UI currently. If you go to Figma, we have defined what particular shapes we are using for each of the component. Like you would have gotten a hint over here that like light green and square is for namespaces and a uh, pentagon is for deployments and stuff like that but they are properly defined in figma for now in future once we launch this to public we will probably have a legend which will come from like right or left side where it will show that this particular shape and this particular color resounds to that particular resource type so if you want to get more detail about that you can go to figma uh, let me see if i can find that if anyone else has any yeah i dropped the link in the chat oh okay great thank you yeah. and um actually joy joy great question um the end so drew gave the answer which is well it's a it's a poor man's answer or it's not a good answer like the, 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 and not, that's no reflection of Druv. Well, actually, in this case, it directly is Druv. <laughs> um, uh, Joy, the, the right answer should be I don't know why you're asking that question. It's so obvious what, what the shapes mean, but that's not the case, right? It's not obvious what they mean and what they do and what's a rounded rectangle versus a hexagon versus a pentagon versus a, well, I don't know, nothing. You have to go to the legend. Ah, oh, geez. Well, I guess it's not very intuitive then. Well, so Joy, like, what a great question. Um, there should be a much better answer. We should work to, we should strive for never hearing that question again. So um, Joy or and everyone else here, if, you, if you're inclined, I mean, you know, ponder on it for a little while. Think, think about it. There are certain things that can really that can really help. There's certain things that, like, um, if there's a node on the map that is in fact a container, well, you might be able to show a Docker logo or a whale that kind of looks like a Docker logo that would probably intimate to the user that it's a container. All right. Okay. Fine. Okay, maybe if, you know, there's a bunch of Kubernetes flavors out there, distros. I don't know if you, there's like a hundred something of them. I don't know if you know that. I mean, a hundred certified distros. And, you know, there's some that are much, much more popular than others. And so, well, okay, that might be one piece of info. Like, let's say that we're, and, and we are right now, we're looking at a single cluster, a Kubernetes cluster. It might have multiple nodes and it's got the different services and namespaces and it's, it's got all kinds of objects and things within that cluster but that cluster it might be a an open shift cluster or um or an eks cluster or a, it might be of a certain type of system okay well 
that logo, I guess what I'm getting at is like logos are quite communicative because it's the, that that's the thing, you know, like the logo is a thing is the, and you either know the logo or you don't, but that in my mind, that's one of the closest ways that you can precisely communicate to someone like what this thing is. But that's not very creative what I've just said. So um, to Jubril's point, there are quite a number of other projects um, out here that are out, out, out there that, that are similar to this. They are visual topologies. There are competing projects, projects that kind of compete with Meshery. Most of them are closed source um, that have similar user interfaces. And um, why did I bring them up? Uh, oh, is to say, you know, the, the, there's some inspiration to be gotten from some of those. I've had teams in the past create some of these. Maybe I'll I'll share some screenshots of what they've they've created. Um, but I'm disappointed with the answer that I just gave. Like I, I feel like oh, what I just said. Like a, we need to make sure that we're um, using the logos, following the terms the logos terms. Like which I, I would think that we would. And most logos are available as an SVG, which is great because. We need for things to scale, zoom in and zoom out, scale um, well. So, you know, anything that's rasterized isn't going to do it for us. Okay, fine. This is part of the question, part of the answer. One of the things that, that all of us might notice is that these entities that are on the map, they're, well, I guess they're related because like there's a group of blue ones and there's a group of green ones. So they're probably kind of like of the same thing. But are, is any, are any of them talking to each other? Or is there any interchange between them? Or? I don't know, we should probably, at some point, we should probably see that interchange. How real time would that be if there's traffic going across them? There's like a year's worth of work. And I don't, I don't say that, I say that literally a year's worth of work to do, to build out like very rich set of interactions to be done here. If you think about it very briefly, any operations, any um, features that you can invoke in other areas of meshery, there, all of those can be done from with in this visual topology as well. And some of them are a lot easier to be done. Some of them might be slightly harder, maybe, or it'd be about the same. Um, Drew, if you right click on these, anything gonna happen for us? Yeah, okay. oh, yeah, I totally forgot about that. So like we have uh, in future working where we could right click and some options specific to that mesh could Come up like currently for demo we had uh, one where you would show performance profile and that was it. And, mm, yeah, so it will basically load a performance test which you can run over there, stuff like that. This is great. So if folks, if if anyone has interest here, please see Drew. Uh, give feedback. Maybe jump into the project. Drew, always good to get an update um, on this. I think I think this that this will be eventually really helpful for people. It'll take the blinders off. Well, thank you, Drew. Uh, we don't have Isuko on the call today, so I guess we should move the air gap uh, stuff to a later point, or should we discuss it right now, Lee? Oh, sorry, I'm getting hammered with other messages. Uh, oh, the meshery preflight design spec. Yeah, I think we should um, dig into it because. Um, oh, I meant the air gap support. Uh, oh, uh, uh -huh. Isuko is not on the call today. I guess he won't join. Yeah, maybe, maybe you will hold off on it just because he's not here. Okay, cool. Uh, I guess we have Husayna next. Yes. Uh, 
so to give some context uh, measure ctl uh, currently like uh, we we support multiple kubernetes platforms like uh, uh, gk uh, aks eks and minikube so we leverage their usually their uh, native clis to deploy machinery onto their cluster so uh, what hosaina is trying to do is to uh, uh, potentially remove those dependencies and she has set up a design spec for it yeah yeah so uh, basically we have the ask is to actually get rid of any scripts uh, to deploy machinery onto these platforms and uh, use uh, golang uh, sdks or uh, enhance our uh, mesh kit uh, like uh, currently mesh kit already has uh, uh, apis to detect uh, cube config and a few other things so uh, the requirement for uh, bringing up mesh uh, varies for each cloud platform so some uh, cloud uh, providers they already have uh, a clis uh, which can uh, get us the cube config file uh, with a single command and they do have uh, uh, sdks uh, available but not all apis are exposed some places the apis are uh, like uh, placeholders so that's what i observed with uh, aks and uh, eks as well so the task is to actually explore these uh, uh, apis available and uh, write uh, any code uh, where uh, it's not straight forward so in case of uh, eks i think there are two apis which we can use like it says list clusters or describe describe clusters from where we can get all the uh, we might get lot of information again we need to filter for uh, the given uh, region name or cluster name so there would be some uh, work to be done there i guess so even for gke like we have a complicated set of steps but recently i came across one more uh, article where uh, it can be done with a single g cloud command so uh, i am yet to explore uh, how this can be done if if at all there is another uh, uh, sdk that i can uh, make use make use of so i have been taking lot of time but uh, I, i really didn't get uh, time to work on this uh, hopefully i will uh, do it in the coming weeks and another thing which came in recently was about uh, docker compose so earlier it it used to be a separate command docker hyphen compose uh, so the docker has uh, uh, made it an implicit command like so docker space compose so and this also has a, a golang uh, sdk support so we we do use uh, docker compose command if it is not available we also go and fetch it from uh, github so that uh, dependency also we have to remove so this is another uh, requirement so so in terms of in sequence of priority like the compose one is is perhaps lower on the totem pole so to speak or is perhaps of not of of the lower of the lowest priority maybe um because it's fairly well taken care of today like it's is generally present on individual systems and when it isn't we go grab it and and um the the one change that might be in anyway there's that um there the more popular systems that we do manage kubernetes systems that we see people using are well actually surprisingly i guess by by count it has been gke more than it has been eks 
but between those two, GKE, EKS, and then AKS has been much further in between. But um, Hussein, have you, like in an ideal world, may maybe that would be the sequence by which we would chase after these, but ha have you already started to get traction with one of these before the other? Yeah, I started off with GKE itself. So I'll- how, how, how dare you start on the first priority? That's a, all right, okay, fine. Okay. It's like It's like we're in sync or something. Oh no. Uh, Hussein, are you still there? I interrupt. No, that, that's all I had actually. Oh. So, uh, oh, nice. Okay. Hey, of the you were saying um, you'd done, you know, you'd done research across all of these. Obviously, you got the links to each of the SDKs, and but then you'd said uh, while you're researching GKE, and uh, I think it's the G is it G Cloud? That's the name of the CLI. Yes. Yes. Yeah that there was more or less like a single G cloud command that would, yes. you know, yeah. is, was that a pleasant discovery or was that more of, were you discovering that and dismayed that, that it was so easy using the, wrapping the CLI, but harder using the SDK? Uh, the current, a uh, way of doing uh, GKE config right now, it has a set of steps. And I think this G cloud uh, CLI also does all of that. So it's like a wrapper around. And uh, if we can explore uh, around uh, the second CLI, single CLI, G cloud CLI. So that would be simpler even uh, if we have to do it the SDK way. So I was thinking, Maybe I'll uh, explore that. Um, cool. And Navendu had a, a nice comment in the chat about sort of the state of the Docker Compose. Um, no, the refactored Docker Compose. Mm -hmm. uh, so that might reinforce it coming a little bit later. The, the singular exception to that is that we were asked last year to speak at DockerCon on um, WebAssembly. And um, it had been briefly discussed that we might be asked to speak again this year. Uh, and the topic being on Docker Compose and doing, doing that exactly like um, moving off of the CLI and moving into use of their new Golang implementation. That would be, if they ask us, we might try to help we might shift that priority and try to help get that accomplished, probably with their help, um, to in order to present because that that conference is coming up pretty soon. But but that's TBD yeah. there. Yeah, with the current state, I think it will be too difficult for us to try to implement this because most of the stuff, like they haven't really thought, uh, made it so that we it it could be used like we are planning to use it. So they suggested me to. Like continue on with the with the uh, the CL their CLI so yeah. Sure. So going back to GKE, um, good well, Husayna, do we? It might be about time to crack open individual issues. On yes, the, I was thinking of doing that. I, I shall do that actually. So nice. There is one already open to uh, do this. Uh, I'll open two more for uh, EKS and AKS. And Docker Compose, anyway, we have one separate PR. Nice. Do you, so in terms of comfortable timing, not that we're on, not that we've been able to bring ourselves to like a strict cadence of when releases happen, we're still far from that but we're but as we work toward that um if we if we think about just if we think real high level like so we're we're i don't know about a third of the way into or a half of the way into the 6.0 release 
So what for mesh free CTL, it was getting Kubernetes supported through all the system commands. And we are mostly on the other side of that. Navendu, it might make sense as soon as I'm done um, looking at this here for us to share the uh, mesh free CTL spreadsheet. Um, we're also going to cre create support. So Jubril and Khan and Ahmed um, and um, Piyush and other people that I'm not going to name have been working on, oh, Anish, been working on um, patterns for mesh free CTL. So that's, those are in flight and, you know, at least halfway done. Okay, there's, we wanted to do an analysis of the perf command and refactor that. Piyush, was that you that was looking into the, or Navendu, was that you? Might have been Navendu. Uh, yeah, I, I was looking into it. Uh, we are still in the design spec. Okay. We need some, yeah. Feedback on that, okay. And then, yeah, I think then part of our other challenge, and this is actually good for anyone, um, for anyone looking to still make kind of get their feet wet with mesh free CTL is that there are a number of areas within mesh free CTL. There's a few and there's, there's fewer and fewer over time, but there's a few areas where we've not guaranteed compatibility with different operating systems. And there have been assumptions made that mesh free CTL would be running on an Unix based system, Linux or Mac OS. And so the compatibility with Windows is an open question. And Navendu, so before Navendu talks about that, um, Husseina, what I was trying to bring up here is if, if we think that like that GK, that first one, like the GKE, it, it's, it's cons like if this is another three to four weeks away, it's conceivable that maybe the GKE might land within and some of the others might spill over. Yeah, sure. GK, we can target for 6.0.6. Okay. That and that feel, I'm assuming like that, that, that feels comfortable, right? Or that doesn't feel too tight. No. Okay. Um, all right. I'm the venue. Uh, just to do a, a quick look into the measure CTL spreadsheets. So what Lee was mentioning about was the uh, compatibility with win Windows. So we haven't actually confirmed or tested all these commands uh, on Windows machines. So yeah, it might be best if, if anyone can volunteer and try this out on a Windows machine. And uh, yeah, I guess that's it. And uh, about the perf command, uh, yeah, we are still in the design specs kind of thing, uh, and uh, we still need to uh, complete the spec before we create it into issues. Uh, I, I have left left the link in the chat. Uh, you can check this out. Uh, I think it would be best if you we just look into the another agenda. We have Piyush with uh, Meshri pre-flight checks. Piyush, do you want to go ahead? Hello everyone, and uh, I am discussing mm, like part of system check, which is actually to verify the environment, like to check if the environment is re ready to deploy meshery, or like either supports the minimum requirements to deploy a meshery. Uh, so this is a part of uh, a bigger bigger issue that is uh, meshery CTL system check. And this is the pre-flag check of uh, that mm, that bigger check part. Okay, so here yeah, we are checking actually Docker. If Docker is available or not, uh, then Kubernetes. Uh, if uh, we are able to initialize a client and uh, we are able to query it, and then we are checking if the Kubernetes version is actually the minimum required version uh, for the deployment. Okay, so I actually created a, a spec a spec here. Let me share it. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
did just happen. Let me share it here. I think. Yeah, that's it. Let me. I'm not sure why my screen is black. Uh, like it's stuck for some reason. Let me. I should open it in another tab. Okay. Are you able to see my screen? Oh, uh, yes, Peter. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, sure. So the you know, like the first part was to verify the Docker presence and Kubernetes, and I told you about the minimum version check. So uh, verifying Docker and Docker Compose was uh, like I was trying to do it with executing the command Docker PS and Docker Compose version. If they are not returning any errors, that means they are available there. And for the part of Kubernetes API, I was trying to initialize a client with the help of MeshKit Cube, and then query it to get some pods, uh, the, some data about pods if they are available there. That means I, if uh, it, this does not return an error, that means I am able to query the Kubernetes API. Kubernetes API. And the last part was uh, there was some. A third part also included in uh, Kubernetes API, which was to check if Meshri has the required level of privileges. That is, if Meshri is having the cluster admin role assigned in the Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes. So, I was trying to get uh, like how we can actually check about it. So, Abhishek told that we can do it uh, by checking Meshri's manifest file but i was quite confused if we are already declaring it as a cluster admin then do we actually need to check it uh, like to like check it again so i haven't uh, like i'm not sure about that so i skipped it for a while and the last part was to check the kubernetes uh, version so i am also not aware of what are the minimum versions for these like for a machinery deployment. So these are the two things that are actually uh, making troubles for me. So yeah, some feedback on this would be really great. Nice. Yeah, um, Piyush, one piece of feedback with respect to confirming cluster admin role is there's the, I don't know what the, um, the Go client um, calls this, but from the command line, from kubectl, there's this, uh, can I, uh, so it's a kubectl auth, can I, uh, and I'll, I pay, I'll put, yeah, that's, that's probably, yeah, that, actually what you've got is probably good enough, can I, can hyphen I, and as you go to explore and familiarize with that, yeah, okay. it's actually, um, yeah, no, no okay, white space. Okay. I'll check about it. Nice. And uh, what about uh, these things? Like, uh, I have to check the current, I have to match the current versions with the minimum versions. So, do we have any data upon it, like the minimum versions? Yeah, we do. It's in the, the if you go to the docs.mastery.io, there are, mm -hmm. there is a compatibility matrix. And mm -hmm. And actually, the compatibility matrix will be really important to the project as it go, um, as it goes forth. Uh, it is not well it is not well maintained. Uh, it's um, not programmatically updated and needs to be. Um, for the moment, um, I, I mean, I couldn't even tell you like what is the required like what well. I guess I could tell you some, but um, yeah, it's a good check for us to do. It's appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, over time, we will build out better processes by which we're able to say, if you're running this version of Meshery, it is compatible with these versions of Kubernetes. And that's something that we'll just get better at um, over time. So, so yeah. 
right now you might end up hard coding something like it has to be this for actually for, for the time being just the retrieval of that is mm -hmm. is helpful um the the challenge that you will have in this command is that you know ideally what you're showing as output you're saying okay i'm checking on this oh that looks good check mark or i'm checking on this mm -hmm. that, oh, that failed x and, and yeah, the, problem, I mean. the problem with my answer is that you're like well i'm not sure if i should put a check or an x and so um for the time being we'll just put a check because that is generally true and until we get better practices we it's better for us to give a false positive, which, because we'll be right most of the time, we'll be compatible most of the time. Something for us to fix in the future. So there's a couple of specs, I guess, that are out there just as, as when Nivendu goes to wrap us up that, so that, so Piyush has one out there on system check on, and Piyush, I think one of the things for me to rationalize in my own head and for everyone else that considers this is that, <clears throat> Well, there are there, the value of such a check is both um, prior to installing Meshery is to go just like you install a piece of software on your your local machine. Sometimes you're installing it and it says, "Oh, well, you actually don't have this other dependency. You you need this other thing." And so before you go to deploy, before you do Meshery system start, Meshery CTL system start, people could invoke this command to just do a pre prerequisite check, a pre-flight check, make sure Meshery is going to be able to run and do its thing. Then there's value in it post-deployment as well, like ongoing, is Meshery healthy? And um, there's some amount of consideration for if we get this done fairly well. Um, and so Piyush missed some of what I said. I'll put this into the spec, but some of this might be that when someone runs Meshery CTL system start, it might be appropriate to implicitly do a pre-flight check, depending upon how involved it is and how long it takes. But it might be something to run in the, I don't know, maybe in the background, maybe not. But that's part of what needs to be thought through is like, it isn't always pre-flight, it's post-flight, it's diagnostics. Like this leans into, Piyush, this leans into, uh, you know, the, another discussion around, um, well, around helping troubleshoot users' environments that are having problems. If they're having problems running Meshery um, and they're in the Slack or they're, or they're wherever in the discuss forum saying they're having challenges, well, there'll be this standard set of questions that you'll ask them. You'll be like, okay, well, hey, what version of Meshery are you running? What version of Meshery CTL? What version of the adapters? What's your, what type of Kubernetes system? What blah, blah, blah. And it just like agnosium, it goes on for a while. What ver you're running, oh, you're, you're running Istio, what version of that, whatever, blah, blah, blah. and it's just like, you might not need all that info in every, every time that you're helping a user, um, but you may, and it's pretty commonplace. And to put that burden on the user, it means that they have to be committed and really wanting to get a solution. Because most of the time, most of us will use a piece of software, it crashed, something happened. If you're like me, you're, you say a curse word out the side of your mouth and then keep going and maybe you don't use that software anymore. And that would be terrible. Like, so my point is, you know, you use some software today, it crashes and it says, oh, wait, we detected that we crashed. Would you like to send a crash report? Oh, that's great. That's the type of thing that Mastery should have, whether it's automated like that or it's just a manual command that people can run to collect up their diagnostics info and um, make it easy for them to open up a ticket, to, to paste that either into a GitHub issue or into a discuss forum or something. And so these things are highly intertwined because it's a lot of the same checks. So, cool. Seven minutes after an environment report, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense to add, yeah. I agree. Um, any other comments to Piyush before we wind up? Yeah, um, I would just like to add like, what if to check if maybe Docker is installed, you just run the which command, like which Docker, and if the binary is in their path, you know it's installed. Unless the user does some weird stuff and installs it in a custom path. 
but most times they just go default. I almost typed it out as fast as I could do. Part of the problem is that, you know, it's not infrequent. Well, it's less and less frequent over time, but it used to be the case that people would try to execute Docker as a command and their user didn't wasn't permissioned to actually run Docker. And so that would be an issue. So like, uh, as, as an example of like why you want to, it kind of goes back to what Piyush was saying is like, hey, you know, there's this check that I want to do for whether or not Meshery has a service account and whether or not that service account is, has cluster admin as permissions, he could just look at the manifest and say, yeah, it's in there, we're good. Well, maybe, but to actually go check on it and, and like invoke the thing, do a, a dry run or do a, a ping, an actual ping, an actual, so to, to actually do a Docker something something command, that that would take you a step further. You're, you're right, though. I mean, you could have a series of levels of depth of interrogation of like, hey, do you just want to do a cursory environment check or do you want to do a full diagnostics? And so maybe you take them through the rest. In this case, that would be over engineering for us. We just want to like get to the end point of like, um, but that type of a concept that I just said about a tiered interrogation, a tiered like a full discovery versus a cursory, a light check. That's the type of thing that Mesh Sync does when it interrogates Kubernetes and um, looks around the environment, retrieves all the no, all the inf all the entities, all the objects. It can go lightweight real quick, or it could go real deep. And actually, because that's such a central and core thing to Meshery, and the fact that that Mesh Sync instances one per Kubernetes cluster. Each cluster, you know, has users having 50 clusters, 10 nodes a cluster. Holy cow, like actually making that efficient and having tiered discovery is an important concept there. With that, Navendu, we're out of time. Um, yeah, we've missed two items on the agenda, but I guess we will check in with Naimat and Joy over Slack. Uh, I guess that's it. Thank you, everyone. I guess we'll see you Friday on the community core. Bye. Bye. Bye, Lizette. Bye. Bye. Bye.